Would you remain standing with me for the reading of God's word? And this morning, I ask you to meet me in the Old Testament book of Ruth. And for those of you who may not be all that familiar with the Bible, the book of Ruth is the eighth book from the beginning. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. Once you find it, would you follow along as I read chapter 2, verses 1 through 23. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she's continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, whose, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some leftover. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also, pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today, and where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, since it was way back in the month of May when we were last here in the book of Ruth, I should say a couple of things in way of review to get us all caught up on the story so far. And the first thing to be noted is that the book of Ruth is a true story, meaning the point the author is making about life is the point God is making about life. So what we find here isn't something that may or may not be applicable to you. Rather, it's the living word of God speaking God's truth to us today. And so it's important to keep that in mind as we engage with this story, and also to remember that like any good story, the characters and details are much more than they appear on the surface. 
Now, to that point, one theologian said this about the book of Ruth, quote, People and events that appear on the surface to enter the story randomly are actually embedded in the strata of salvation history. We just have to dig a little below the surface to find them, end quote. So this morning, we'll do a bit of digging when it comes to the characters and details that we come across here as we make our way through Ruth chapter 2. But finally, in way of recap, I think the best way I could sum up what the opening chapter, chapter 1, was all about is by saying that while it's not always easy to trust the Lord, it is always the only right way and the best way forward in life. It's not always easy to trust the Lord, but it is always the only right way and the best way forward. In life, And that premise is supported by what we found in the first scene of the story there in chapter 1. As we read about Ruth's in-laws making the choice to leave God's people in God's dwelling place because God's ways just seemed too difficult. More specifically, chapter 1 told us that there was a famine in the land, and so the place where they were living, Bethlehem, which if you recall means house of bread, had become for Naomi and her family a visible reminder that God and his ways were too difficult. They weren't worthy of trust, and so they decided to take their chances in the land of God's enemies, the land of Moab. And the author then spends the rest of chapter 1 detailing how things went from bad to worse, eventually emptying Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, of absolutely everything. And so, because of her dire situation, chapter 1 ends with Naomi deciding to return to the Lord. And with that, we've come to where we find ourselves today here in chapter 2, ready to find out the answer the authors left us all wondering. What will these two needy ladies find as they come to God? What will Naomi find? with her return to the Lord after being gone for a decade? And then what will her daughter-in-law Ruth find with her turning to the Lord for the very first time? Well, our text will answer those questions for us, but first, whenever we open God's Word, it's important for us to understand what the original audience was experiencing. So in order to do that, would you come with me this morning in your mind's eye to a place and time and history of chaos and anarchy. A time when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And I want you to come with me there because that's where we find ourselves in this biblical story of Ruth. And I say that because if you take just a quick glance back to chapter 1, verse 1, the author of Ruth sets the scene in the days when the judges ruled. And if you turn back just one page in your Bibles to the end of the book of Judges, chapter 21, verse 25 tells us that in those days there was no king in Israel, and what was everyone doing? What was right in their own eyes. In other words, chaos and anarchy was the headline news of the day. And for what it's worth, this dark time in history wasn't confined to God's people in the land of Israel. Historians have noted about this time period that, quote, most of the ancient world was embroiled in chaos, too. The Egyptians, Hittites, and Mesopotamians were in general decline. Greece was undergoing political upheaval, and the Philistines were wreaking havoc in the Mediterranean basin. And though this chaotic time period in history was a very long time ago, it's actually not all that difficult for us to understand what it's like because it's really not all that different from the world that we inhabit today. All it really takes is a couple of minutes reading the current headlines from around the world, and you'll see things reported like the war in Ukraine, threats from ISIS, instability between China and Taiwan, the investigation by the Justice Department of the second largest faith group in the U.S. And I'll stop there because I'm sure you get the point. Suffice to say, the setting of the book of Ruth is a setting we're all too familiar with. And while that setting is important to our understanding of Ruth, 
I want you to know that the author is more concerned with what is happening on a micro level, like in the lives of a handful of people. People who are not only having to deal with the difficulties of the world around them, but people who are also having to deal with the personal difficulties found in their own hearts and minds. And as the author reports on this, he gives some subtle clues, pointing to the reality that within the chaos that we find in the world and in our own hearts, there is a God who stands over it all. A God of love and power and knowledge who is at work to bring the chaos and the anarchy into peaceful order under the good rule of his appointed king. And that's what the book of Ruth is here to remind us of, and that's good news for needy people, isn't it? And that good news is ours to discover and experience, and we find out how by answering some questions and then by exploring some clues that we find in today's passage. So let's begin with some questions. We've already alluded to the question the author leaves us wondering at the end of chapter 1, namely, what will Naomi and Ruth find when they come to the Lord? Naomi, in her return to the Lord after being gone for 10 years, and Ruth and her turning to the Lord for the very first time. But before we get to that question, our text wants us to first consider where you are when it comes to God. We're talking this morning about Naomi and Ruth and their faith journey with the Lord, but because God's word is living and active, it means to engage you this morning as well and ask you, where are you when it comes to the Lord? Some here may wonder if God even cares about that, because maybe your lived experience so far has been a difficult one of being looked over or ignored. But I assure you this morning that that is not the case when it comes to you and the Lord. That's one of the many reasons God's given us this book of Ruth. He wants us to know that everybody matters. And that in his story, there is only one hero, and he just so happens to come from the lineage of Ruth, a nobody from the world's standards. And what's more, he'll be born in the same little town we read about in chapter 1, a little nowhere place called Bethlehem. So, yes, the world sometimes does overlook and make us feel like we don't matter. You, like Ruth, may be a widow, an immigrant, and or a poor person, but in the kingdom of God, you matter to God. So, where are you this morning when it comes to him? On the path of returning to him like Naomi was? Or just beginning your life with him like Ruth? Wherever you are, the important thing is that you know that you matter to God, and because you do, he's made a way possible for you to come to know him. And if you're curious about that and would like to talk with someone more about that, let's meet up following the service, because I would love to hear from you. But for now, let's move on to another question our text wants us to answer, and that question is, what do Naomi and Ruth find when they come to the Lord. And in order to answer this question, we'll have to <clears throat> work our way through chapter 2, and I'll offer some running commentary as we do. Hopefully it's not too distracting. So let's look again at chapter 2, verse 1, where the author tells us, Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Now, at this point in the story, Naomi isn't aware of this relative. The author is simply letting us, the readers, know uh, in on an important detail. And that word worthy there describing Boaz is a multifaceted word meaning strong or wealthy or a man of standing. But whichever, whichever of those definitions it means, what we the important thing to remember is that potential and possibility 
are back on Naomi's radar the moment she comes back to the Lord. Let's keep reading verse 2. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. And because most of us aren't in the habit of gleaning ears of grain with our bare hands, I did a little research in order to give you some insight into what's going on here. Uh, remember, it's the barley harvest. And the barley was ready when the stalks would turn a golden color and the ears would bend over because of the weight of the barley kernels. They harvested barley by grabbing a stalk with one hand and chopping it off with a sieve in their other hand. And once they got a big enough stack, they'd lay it on the ground for the ladies to come by, tie up, and then place in piles that they called sheaves. Then someone would come with a wooden tool and thresh the barley, which meant they'd beat the stalks until the chaff would blow away, and all that was left was the barley kernels. But what's really important to note here is that God had set up a system for Israel when it came to their farming as a way for them to provide for the poor and immigrants. And this system is recorded for us in a couple of Old Testament passages. I'll just read one for you from Deuteronomy chapter 24. Here we read this law of God to his people. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over, to them, over them again. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterward. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this. And Ruth was aware of that provision, and so that's what she's talking about doing here in verse 2. Now, we're not told why Naomi doesn't join her. It may be that she's in a state of depression due to the bitterness that had become her identity. And depression can lead to things like discouragement and disengagement. Now, the text doesn't tell us that, but the details it does give us, I think at least warrants that note of speculation. Well, anyways, Ruth went out to see if she could get some food, and verse 3 tells us, she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And did you catch that little phrase there? She happened. She happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. That's another word of saying as luck would have it. But... Because the Bible says there's no such thing as luck or chance, we know that this is the author's way of getting our attention. He's saying she just so happened, wink, wink, to find herself working in a field that belonged to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech, Naomi's deceased husband. By the way, this would have appeared to have happened by chance because these fields were not clearly marked like farms are today with signs and clearly marked roads. These fields would have been one after the other blending together into just one big area, especially confusing for someone like Ruth who wasn't from there. Well, then verse 4 says, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. It's almost like someone is behind the scenes ordering events at just the right time. Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? Now, Boaz isn't being a jerk here, talking harshly about Ruth. He's really asking, Who's her dad? Um, who are her brothers? Who is taking care of her? And he probably wants to know, because as someone who actually cares about others, he doesn't recognize her. Well, let's keep reading verses, back up at verse 6. And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she's continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. 
Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. And then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now, Boaz isn't saying here that God owes Ruth because she's done so much for him. Romans chapter 11, verse 35 says, Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? So really what's going on here is that Boaz is simply praying a blessing on Ruth for the devotion that she's shown in caring for her mother-in-law. So after Boaz gives her blessing, verse 13 records Ruth's response for us as she again falls on the ground and says to him that I have found favor in your eyes for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant though I am not one of your servants and then at mealtime Boaz said to her come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine so she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some leftover. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her, and also pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. Those little verses 15 and 16, they're there, and they uh, are meant that the young men weren't to give Ruth a hard time, even if she gathered some barley from the area where the sheaves were stacked. That area was a no-gather zone because that's where the landowner would pick up what was left for himself, but, that, but also that rule was in place to keep the hired laborers honest so that they wouldn't be tempted themselves to take more than they were allowed. Back to verse 17, picking up there. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was an ephah of Barley, and you may have a footnote there next to an ephah. That was about 30 pounds of barley, which would have been a ton more than day laborers were paid. The regular going payday for them would have been one to two pounds a day. Verse 18 tells us she took it up and went into the city. Her mother in law saw what she had. Glean. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And here we're seeing a turnaround in the life of Naomi. She's blessing the kindness of Boaz, but she's also blessing the Lord because she knows that only the Lord could be behind this amazing kindness coming to them. And we definitely need to unpack that term redeemer that we find there in verse 20 because it really is an important part to this story. So a redeemer was another system put in place by the Lord to protect and provide for his people. Each tribe or clan of Israel had some of these men who would function in this office. And they had several responsibilities to make sure their tribe would survive and prosper. These Redeemers, sometimes called kinsmen redeemers, were to repurchase property sold by family members in order to pay off debt or some other pressing need. This would make sure their inheritance would continue. 
These redeemers were also to buy back, if they had the means to do so, family members who had sold themselves into slavery because of certain financial hardships. They were also to act kind of like a mix between a sheriff and a bounty hunter, avenging the killing of a relative by tracking down the killer and executing justice. And even though marrying a widow to ensure their family line would continue wasn't part of the kinsman redeemer's role, some think that it grew to become part of the custom as well. So needless to say, finding out that the one who showed so much kindness to Ruth was their family's redeemer was a huge deal for both Naomi and Ruth. And we see that excitement in the last verses of this chapter there, verses 21 to 23, where the text says, And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young men, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. And so with the details of chapter 2, the author answers the question about what Naomi and Ruth find when they turn to the Lord. And to say that they were pleasantly surprised would definitely be an understatement. Instead of some hoops of groveling and apology and the assurance from her that she'd never turn from the Lord again, Naomi is met with immediate kindness from the Lord. Instead of a time period of testing or a list of Israelite customs to familiarize herself with and practice before she'd be welcomed, Ruth is met with immediate kindness from the Lord. And so if you're wondering this morning what you might find in returning to the Lord after a season of turning away from him, or if you're wondering this morning what you might find with the Lord if you turn to him for the very first time, God wants you to know that you can rest assured that it will be sheer kindness. Now, the abundance of grain and the generosity of Boaz aren't promises that when we turn to the Lord, we will get an abundance of money. But they do symbolically represent the blessings the Lord lavishes upon all who turn to him. But with that said, did you notice that the kindness they found with the Lord was not abstract or theoretical? It was not abstract or theoretical, but rather the Lord demonstrated his kindness to them by directing them to Boaz's field and therefore to Boaz's protection and provision. And this is one of the most beautiful things about the God of the Bible. He demonstrates his kindness to us in tangible flesh and blood kind of ways. Whether it's manna from heaven, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, or the multiplication of bread and fish to feed the needy crowds, the Lord demonstrates his kindness to us in real ways. And don't we see that ultimately demonstrated in the fact that God himself took on flesh and blood and came into our darkness and death in order to bring us light and life through the work of his Son on the cross? Naomi and Ruth stand to testify this morning that all who turn to the Lord can expect to find the undeserved but much-needed kindness of the Lord. And that kindness finds its ultimate fulfillment in the flesh and blood person and work of Jesus Christ. But along with answering the question about what Naomi and Ruth find when they turn to the Lord, the author also drops certain clues that he wants us to explore. And the first is the note of danger he alludes to throughout chapter 2. I wonder if you noticed it. We see it in verses 8 and 9. We see it again in verses 
15 and 16, and we see it again there in verse 22. This note of danger that the author weaves in this story that he's telling. Multiple times he talks to us about it, and I think the point here is that until our Lord finally returns or calls us home, there's an element of danger that those who turn to the Lord need to be aware of. Not a crippling sort of fear, but a mindful alertness too. And Ruth models the difference for us as she hears the warning of danger from Boaz. And instead of being paralyzed with fear, what does she do? Well, she courageously heads out into the fields to work. The Bible warns those of us who, like Ruth, have come to the Lord for provision and protection that Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for some to devour. We're warned about the persecution that might come our way as we follow Jesus. And we're also warned of the danger that lies even within our own hearts as our sinful flesh continues to crave satisfaction. But like Boaz did for Ruth, our God does that and so much more for us, not only in warning us, but also in watching over us and sending his spirit to help us. And so may we, like Ruth, be courageous and head out into the work the Lord has given us to do. But along with the clue about danger, the author also drops some clues as to how we might experience the good news for needy people that the book of Ruth extends to us. <clears throat> and he does so by recording what happens, or he does so by recording what appears to be the simple ways things just so happen to occur. Like the field Ruth just so happened to find herself in. Or like the kindness of Boaz and the title redeemer of their family that he just so happened to hold. When it comes to God's people and God's ways, nothing is left to chance. Instead, God chooses to accomplish his purposes by his appointed means. And one of the most obvious but sometimes overlooked means by which the Lord brings good news to us is through the means of people. And Boaz serves as an amazing example of that. One theologian described the example of Boaz this way, quote, He acted a noble part when he cheered Ruth and bade her be of good courage now that she was casting in her lot with Naomi and the chosen nation. Observe that he saluted her with words of tender encouragement. For this is precisely what I want all the older Christians among you to do, to those who are the counterparts of Ruth. You who have long been believers in the Lord and in the power of his might, I want you to make a point of looking out the young converts and speaking to them goodly words and comfortable words, whereby they may be cheered and strengthened. If Ruth is to be happy in the land of Israel, a Boaz must look after her and be her true friend. End quote. The point is that because God has chosen to use people to help us experience the good news that we find in him, we ought to be looking to be a Boaz for those around us. And as we think about that a moment this morning, I wonder what being a Boaz could do when it comes to the decline of young people in the church at large. Could it be remedied by the older saints following the example of Boaz? Could the recent rise among younger Christians to deconstruct their faith because of the hard but important issues related to human rights and sexuality be met with a willingness to listen, encourage, and sympathize by following the example 
of Boaz. Might that be used by the Lord to build up their faith and unify the church? The amount of good done by the warm welcome of kindness and blessing extended by Boaz to Ruth cannot be over-exaggerated. And I think that's why we see in Scripture the Lord himself using words like pure and beautiful to describe those who, like Boaz, seek to meet the physical and spiritual needs of others. The Lord uses people to accomplish his purposes of bringing good news to needy people. And I want to be clear that while our greatest need is the good news of the gospel, the forgiveness of our sins through Christ's sacrifice and his righteousness that's credited to us by faith in him. God also calls his children to bring the good news of welcome and kindness into the physical needs of others too. We see this reality on display in today's story, don't we? With those laws God set in place for harvesting their fields, in addition to caring for themselves, God's people were also to be mindful of the well-being of sojourners and the fatherless and the widows. We see this holistic understanding of good news repeated in the New Testament by Jesus' example of bringing good news, especially to the spiritual needs of people, but also to their physical needs. So one question we ought to ask ourselves today as we consider the example of Boaz is, who are those who we might notice as not belonging in our fields, so to speak? Who are those that we might notice as not belonging in our fields? Maybe some <clears throat> refugees, Mike prayed about that this morning. There's refugees in our area, so maybe that is in that area for us. Some refugees, or those in the LGBT community. Does the loving kindness of the Lord that he's shown to us overflow from us to them? Maybe it's someone in need of money, and they're coming to us because we might have some. I wonder, does our American mentality of pull yourself up by your bootstraps carry more weight in those interactions with them than our Christian identity does? The disposition of God's people towards others is meant to reflect the undeserved kindness we've been shown by the Lord. The disposition of God's people towards others is meant to reflect the undeserved kindness we've been shown by the Lord. And it is a powerful means of commending the truth of the gospel to the lost. And since I'm already talking about applications, let me wrap things up with a couple of more. A couple more. First, we saw today from Ruth chapter 2 that the kindness of the Lord awaits all who turn to him in repentance and faith. For Christians, that means whether you've been away from the Lord for years or just a few moments of giving in to temptation, returning to the Lord brings with it an immediate welcome from the Lord. So don't let sin's empty promises or Dealing with the reality of painful consequences keep you from returning to the Lord and experiencing his kindness today. Second, for those of you who may be on the fence about following Ruth's example and leaving everything and turning in trust to Jesus, I want you to know that it may be entirely possible for you to experience a temporal earthly kindness like the one Boaz showed to Ruth without you turning to the Lord. That may be entirely possible, but an earthly kindness can do nothing to help your more pressing need, and that is your spiritual condition before the Lord. You need the Redeemer who Boaz symbolically represents. 
a redeemer who would one day come in flesh and blood to provide us with the righteousness we need to stand before God but cannot earn on oursel by ourselves. You need a redeemer who can protect you from sin's penalty. You need Jesus. And the good news is that he offers provision and protection as gifts to all who, like Naomi and Ruth, turn from their own ways and trust in him as the only way. God's word to you today is that leaving everything behind and starting a new life with him today is costly, but it is worth the cost. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this reminder today that even in the midst of the chaos around us, both in the world at large and in our own lives, you are standing over it all, bringing good news to needy people like us. We thank you, too, that your loving kindness shows up in flesh and blood, that it is not abstract or wishful thinking, and so we thank you for a greater redeemer than Boaz. We thank you for Jesus, who came to us in flesh and blood to give us everything we need for life and godliness. Lord, your word goes on to tell us that we are to show the same kindness to others that you have shown to us. So may we do good to all even as we give careful attention, as your word tells us, to our church family. May we do what we can to provide and to protect those we come into contact with, addressing both their spiritual and their physical needs. And Lord, may the shadow of the wing of the Almighty that we shelter under be extended by us this week as we share the good news of your kindness to those around us. And it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray these things together. Amen.